Hello, everybody. Today I'm here with Tristan Jakob Hoff. Very worried about butchering your name, but I've tried. As Australian born, London based composer and orchestrator that comes more from a classical concert music background, is that right? But recently I made the switch uh, to um, film music and media music in general. His work, uh, he has worked with pretty amazing names. Michael Nyman, uh, Michael Giacchino, David Arnold, and he does all that. And at the same time, he's also uh, written an absolutely fantastic track for our um, new library, Poiesa's Cello. Hi, Tristan, how are you? Hi, Alessandro, I'm, I'm very well, thank you. Again, sorry for butchering your name. Uh, we That's were, all right. <laughs> we were uh, rehearsing it just before starting out, but uh, my uh, German, because this is a German name, it's, it's it's really bad. And it's particularly bad because I also had one year of German classes and yet <laughs> didn't manage. That's more than I have. <laughs> All right, so uh, before um, what we're going to do today is that we're going to uh, do a uh, kind of a live walkthrough of your track. It's not really going to be a walkthrough. It's more like we chat about the library. We go into a couple of, um, you know, snippets uh, within the track that we think it's interesting. You can tell me um, a little bit about what you think about uh, Poyes's cello. But before we do all that, let's play it back. Let's do it. Wow, absolutely stunning. I really, really love this piece. Um, I really love the harmonies, first of all. I really love the way you play together with dissonance, but then all of a sudden you get these really beautiful uh, major chords, uh, completely unexpected in a, in a very good way. And also, since obviously it's a bit of a plug for for the library that I made, <laughs> also, <laughs> just, just a tiny bit. Uh, I also really love the way you use all the uh, textures and all the different articulations that were available. Uh, I tried to use as many of them as I could, I could fit in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, considering that the library um, comes with, well, it comes with 47 different articulations, but you, you didn't use any um, uh, shorts at all. I didn't, no. I, you remember, I, I had a pizzicato in there at some point, and you told me to yeah. take it out. 
Yeah, well, I, I just thought that it was so beautiful just uh, exploring only the textual ones. Also because the other official demo track that we released that was by Miriam, which is also yeah. another uh, um, interview uh, with her coming soon, was kind of naturally took the completely opposite approach. Uh, yours is very processed and it has a lot of stuff. Hers is completely dry uh, and uh, uses a lot of shorts uh, is very much you know uh, in your face and also like a completely different approach so it was nice that we had these completely two separate uh, separate approaches to kind of showcase two different uh, aspects of the uh, of the library uh, the <clears throat> i'm gonna let you um you know uh, showcase a few uh, elements that you of the track that you think are particularly interesting but as a first question what do you have like a specific articulation that maybe you started writing from or any that inspired you um yeah, you know what? i went straight for the weird stuff so <laughs> I was, you know, I, part of the reason why I asked actually to, to write this demo for you is because when you were telling me about it, you were saying it's a, uh, you know, that you're really focusing on articulations that you couldn't get from your, your standard cello libraries. Uh, and part of, you know, uh, as you said in the intro, I, I come from a classical background. Um, so my way of writing for many, many years has been based on, you know, I used to do everything in, uh, in a notation program in Sibelius, and um, it's very much sort of traditional classical orchestration. But as I've moved more and more into sort of media composition, I've tried to get to, uh, to a way of writing where I can write something in Cubase, and at the other end, it sounds like a finished track. It's not something that, you know, you have to imagine what an orchestra sounds like. Um, so because of that, uh, I'm now starting to branch out a lot more into, into different sorts of textures and things that make those, you know, less classical tracks sound interesting. Uh, so for me, this was a really good way to, to sort of explore the textural side of things. I don't usually write just sort of straight textural stuff. Um, yeah, and it's like a very popular genre in film scoring yeah, exactly. to write for uh, as well now, like it's been in my experience at least, widely requested by directors and, mm. and producers seems to be mm. very much in vogue, yeah. Yeah, totally. So yeah, for me, the uh, the first, uh, when I was sort of playing through all of the textures, the, the one that leapt out of me was the um, uh, the tailpiece, the oh, yeah. tailpiece, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, is, is, a, is a great technique. Um, I will just show you briefly. Um, so uh, this was the, the tail piece. Um, and what I've done with most of these tracks, about all of them, uh, if you have a look at the, the track names, you can see I've actually put two, uh, two articulations per track. And yeah. so this uses the, the crossfade a lot uh, between those, those two articulations. So in this case, I think it starts with tail piece. I'm just gonna solo it and have a listen. It's a mix. So that's a mix of tailpiece and uh, textural dense. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, it's this kind of very ethereal sound. It's quite otherworldly and it, it, it doesn't sound like a cello. That's what I really liked about it. It's just sort of, it's, um, it sounds like sort of, you know, some sort of uh, otherworldly, um, you know, weird sort of angelic yeah actually the the funny thing is that before we we were like in the pre-production of this library i watched a ton of youtube videos of um of cellist uh explaining techniques from the uh from the contemporary repertoire and uh, also i've been looking at some scores and and this particular one bow on tailpiece was one of my favorites and mm -hmm. the cellist that we had on the session alan black is the principal principal cellist for 
Charlotte Symphony Orchestra. Ne- never heard of this articulation before. So I, we actually had to bring up a YouTube video to him. He said, can you do that? He said, oh, yeah. That, he said, like, yeah, I'm surprised that you want that, but it's absolutely doable, and we recorded it. <laughs> well, paid off. Paid yeah. Off. So, yeah, that, that was really the starting point for, for this entire track. It was just that, and I think that it has a particular pitch, which my memory is an A. Um, and then the entire sort of track comes out of that sort of sustained note. Um, yeah, which obviously isn't isn't like a pitched articulation. That yeah. that is his own cello. It's like a very unique thing. His own yeah. cello just happened to be resonating in A because, uh, like the tail piece is for whoever doesn't know is is like the ending part of uh, just i think it's, it's made is it's black but i think it's still made of wood uh, i think it's wood yeah I, I think that basically creates tension for the strings uh and um so it doesn't produce uh, any it's not normally used to produce any sound and you can't control the pitch in any way so that is just what naturally happened to be available <laughs> well i think it's kind of fitting isn't it that you know if you're going to do a, a demo for a textual library that you start off with something that is pure it's like it's an actual physical texture right yeah like, exactly yeah and and the properties of that texture become the sound yeah um so yeah and i thought that was a really fun way to you know just have it was it that that was what inspired the rest of the track just that sound um and then uh i think i started playing around with the Bowing behind the bridge as well, which is another really extended technique. So that's when you you play on the, on the, the little bit of the string that's after the bridge, um, but before the tailpiece, uh, yeah. usually very high uh, because it's very short amount of, uh, of string. Uh, I'll just try to play that. Yeah, what you actually get from the bow behind bridge is you get this kind of breathy sound. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear that. I'm, I'm going to guess not. Don't worry. And that's mixed in with harmonics. So the harmonics start here. It's very subtle, sort of just, just a little bit of harmonics. But then I've used a lot more harmonics um, as a kind of accenting feature, uh, which I will come back to because I think that's it's uh, it's better just to talk about the other textural patches here. So. Yeah, j- just just a small comment on all these extended techniques is that one thing that I really admired about this track is that all this stuff has obviously been part of the repertoire for absolutely ages and has been part of film music for ages, but Mm. is normally really associated with horror film music. And yes, your, you know, your track is not like an happy clappy ukulele song by any means, but, but it's also definitely very distant from that kind of horror score kind of world. Uh, it has really some, some beauty in it, beauty in the, you know, in the, in the, you know, most, uh, in the broader uh, possible sense. So I really, I really enjoy the way you, you explore that kind of world. I, um, you know, I, I think it probably is one of these tracks that probably could have gone in a horror direction, but yeah, um, I don't know. I had this idea of, you know, once I'd sort of built up all the textures of adding these chords, um, which let's just talk about the chords for a minute, because they're, these are just using the uh, various um, textural uh, patches again, but yep. using them as if they're just, you know, uh, lungs. You have these nice sort of rich sounding things, but then as the, the notes are held, they start sort of breaking down in really interesting ways. And I, I really like that about them. Um, I even, there's this one, I think I held one of the notes quite a bit longer so you could get more of that. It's 
So the longer you hold those notes for, the more of this kind of... Um, yeah, that's the thing about those. Um, there are four textural patches in the articulation. Maybe if you can open up the articulations menu uh, just for a second for whoever, whatever layer, that they're the same. Yeah. yeah, there are four of them. Basically, it just variations that we got in the studio, kind of really working with the player. And it's possibly the only articulation where you kind of need to play with the sample rather than trying to get the sample to work for you because that won't happen. It's kind of like the, the point was exactly to have like a very long articulation. This is last several seconds, the old sample, and then it loops. And it's kind of a very natural evolving sound. And the the result of that is obviously that you kind of, as, as you say, you kind of need to play with it but the one thing that we try to do is that we would always start the sample with a fairly stable tone and then it would kind of spread out uh, yeah. yeah that's what i really liked about it is it's, it's a little bit unpredictable and yeah. uh so you get results out of it you weren't necessarily expecting and you know that's always i i i have I used to be the sort of composer who was such a control freak and I hated that sort of thing. <laughs> now I really love it because it's inspiring to me. It's, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's bringing new, uh, interesting things that I, I wasn't expecting um, yeah. to the table. And I have used that sort of these textural dense patches a lot through here. So um, just, you know, a, a lot of this track is built around these sorts of sounds. I've used quite a lot of pitch bend in this track as well. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get to that as well. <laughs> that, that 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 I really loved. But this is the kind of yeah weird sort of ethereal sound you can get. A lot of this just sits in the background of this track. When doing uh, when working with this uh, kind of libraries, um, which I mean, I made this one, so obviously I'm particularly biased. But it, it, I agree with what you were saying because there is, there are definitely situations where you want the maximum control over the samples, and even within this own uh, this, this specific library, there are some parts which are obviously way more controllable um, short articulations in particular you can get really you can really tweak them but um, sometimes uh, you know like I my uncle is, is a painter and and I remember as a kid he used to teach me painting a little bit uh, and he, he always said that he loved watercolors because there is only so much that you can, can control over them. They kind of tend to spread and you can't really get the edges right. So you, th there is like a, a little bit of an abstract nature to them that, that, you can, that you can only control that much. And the rest is also, it's also a bit random in, in the best, in the best uh, meaning of the word. And so writing with this kind of samples is really inspiring me for me as well exactly because of what you were saying like i think that's a very good metaphor that can be applied to uh, to this thing as well yeah you you get uh, you know it's serendipitous what what sort of sounds you you're going to end up with it's it's sort of based on uh it becomes very instinctual i think to to write yeah. You, you know, you can't just sort of say, well, this is the idea I've got in my head. I'm going to translate it. You've got to start with the, these are the sounds and then sort of sculpt those sounds rather than trying to bend them to your own will. Yeah, and especially in something like that where you had like a very tough brief, which was, you know, to write an entire track just out of a cello. Because <laughs> that that's the other thing that, you know, there is not like it's not very common to write for a cello ensemble <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? well indeed and i did cheat a little bit in this not by um, yeah. uh you know i didn't uh it, it uses entirely uh place as cello this track but um i've added a few little bits and pieces to uh to give it a bit of extra height and a bit of extra depth in the yeah. in, in the mix so for instance on those chords um you'll hear this, I've got this sort of bass line here, which is just the bottom of end of these, which, which is pretty low. And that is in fact, um, I'm using a, a 
uh, send to a plugin called Submarine, which uh, is just adding subharmonic frequencies to it. Um, so it almost sounds like a double bass. So that's, yeah. you know, it's, it's another way you can sort of just tweak this. Uh, I, I had a lot of fun trying to get that right, actually. I remember... Um, I have to, have to actually have some, uh, I think, the sends on this channel, if I can bring them up. Are, um, yeah. Oh, nice. They do this. Yeah, so so you, you get a bit of a fade in. Yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. I'm going to steal this technique. Okay, so Submarine is actually a send rather than an insert. And then you That's automate right, it. Yeah. So the automation that we're looking at is the send because I can't right. really read what it is. So that, that that's like a send. That's the send to, to Submarine, which is just the submarine. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I really love this technique. So you're kind of... It's almost like you're feeding in an extra octave lower. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it sort of almost just it, it blends in more more uh, naturally that way. Yeah. Oh, funny. Otherwise, it sounded a bit harsh. And yeah, also you're kind of preserving the attack of the original sample. Exactly. And yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Like that. So yeah, that was that was a fun little trick. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I th one of my very favorite things, and I think it's sort of almost. It, it makes this track in some ways is this these repeated notes oh yeah the motion um, yeah what i found with these is so uh for people who aren't familiar with the library which would be everybody yeah um these motion batches which are yeah. just repeated eighths notes or quarters or halves or twelfths and in this case i have a patch which uh has uh Eighths on one side and on the other, it's got the swoops back. It's got twelfths. And because you can cross fade between these, that's what I've been doing. So you use CC1 to cross fade. Yeah. Um, so you get, you know, these kind of. You can you can sort of build these natural um, speed speeding up and then slowing down again. And you know I I like it's quite a subtle effect to have in the background, but it gives it a sense of motion and it also gives it a sort of uh, sense of uh, you know, it sounds like the sort of thing you would ask a human to do, which is to just, you know, alternate between these, uh, these, you know, these different rhythms um, in a very natural way. And I, the way I played it was very much, you know, I, re I recorded just some lines and then just rode the, uh, the mod wheel in order to get it to, you know, to sound sort of right in my head. Um, have you been tweaking the um, crossfade curves uh, at all for those that are very I haven't. No. Because uh, one thing that I found interesting and it was actually surprising to me as well uh, when doing uh, when dealing with this library when using this library was that I if you can click on the advanced me uh, menu just for a second so that people can know what we're talking about there are three available crossfade curves and. The reason why we included these three uh, with these three options was that obviously, as developer, you you can predict which two articulations the user is going to select. So, uh, giving those different crossfading curves kind of gives the user the possibility of an extra tweak. It goes back to like you know being a control freak in uh, in when using samples, so that you can really fine uh, tweak, uh, you can really fine tune the crossfading point. But actually, there is another way that I've been using those, which is to actually not getting something very smooth sound, not getting like a very smooth sounding a tr transition, but rather, you know, getting it to a point where you actually hearing both uh, articulations yeah. at the same time, mm -hmm. and then you can crossfade between layer A, both playing together, and uh, and layer B, which can lead to very interesting effects in yes. uh, in, in very specific yeah. um, bits of music. And the reason why I was thinking about it is that 
you know, maybe this is not like the perfect cross-fading curve for, for what you were trying to do. Like maybe the central one would have worked better in terms of getting closer to what a human being would do when cross-fading from eight notes to uh, to 12 notes. But actually it works better because you get that that midpoint where exactly, you, get, yeah. you get both yeah. playing together and create somewhere in between, yeah. Interesting interlogging rhythm. So yeah. it's really like that. Yeah, I did. I, there was at least one of these traps. I think it might be the uh, <clears throat> this textural medium, textural dense one, where I spent a lot of time in. Oops, no. I spent a lot of time in the middle of. Yeah, so it's like almost perfectly in the middle yeah. here, um, and that. Yeah, as you say, you can just. In fact, it's entirely in the middle. That one. There's another one where it's sort of just occasionally um, moves away from the middle in one direction or the other, but it sort of sits mostly in the middle. And that way you can get this real sense of, um, yeah, this just, again, it just, it gives you an extra layer of unpredictability because you have got these textural, you know, dense or sparse or whatever, but, you know, where they begin to overlap in, in, in ways that you can't ever predict. Um, yeah. And, and my way of sort of composing with that is to just use my ears as much as possible and sit on the mod wheel and just, you know, if it feels like it needs to go in one direction or another, then, then just do that. Um, yeah, which is probably a good advice for anything music related. We, we tend to live in a, in a time where technology is so amazing that we're very used to look at a screen and so look yeah. at things but you know we forget that this should be the primary <laughs> okay and i mean if you look at this track it's uh it's completely off the grid i mean i i recorded the entire thing just by what felt right um i think there is some very minor these chords sort of have a have a sort of semi-regular interval that that speeds up um but generally speaking, I, you know, I really just tried to, uh, to do whatever felt right. So did you kind of played it in a lot? Rather yeah, than absolutely. Yeah. So th th this might be a good, a good bridge to uh, take a little bit of a break and talk about you as a composer a little bit. Because mm. That interests me uh, quite a bit because I'm quite the opposite. I'm a, tend to be a pretty terrible pianist. I mean, I compose at the piano, but just, but you know, I can do chords and very minor things but i'm definitely not not a not a player whereas you are right your first how did you get into music was it through piano uh yeah i mean i i've, I've certainly played uh piano for you know, I'm, I'm not gonna say because it made me sound old but for a long <laughs> time um and you know i have a beautiful i'm very lucky we've got a, a beautiful uh, 1968 steinway model oh. B in the next room uh, wow, it's just gorgeous. Uh, my my pride and joy. Um, so you know, I love playing piano. I'm I'm okay at it. I, you know, I'm certainly not a professional, uh, but it's it is uh, it's always been something that I've I've enjoyed doing. And one of the things that I've always done as a pianist is improvise. So I'm constantly just sitting at the piano and coming up with new things, trying stuff out. Trying to trying to make it all sort of sound like a like a piece uh, as, as I go, and uh, as a result, I think that you know that's helped my composing quite a lot because it means that I'm. You know, firstly, it means I, I do think about things from a player's perspective. Um, yeah. But secondly, I, you know, you can, you know, when you sit down, particularly at an instrument like the piano, which is so, yeah, there's just so much you can do with it. Um, you can really try out new harmonies, you know, and you can, you've just got a lot of freedom to, to give stuff a go. And, you know, I spend a lot of time just noodling around. My, my poor neighbors must absolutely hate it, <laughs> uh, but they're very polite. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I do spend a lot of time doing that. But as a composer, it's interesting. I've always, since I was pretty young, I wrote at the computer. Oh, and interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe the first few pieces I wrote when I was very little, I, I, uh, I used to write them on manuscripts, but my handwriting is atrocious. So, you know, I always yeah, I prefer to, to yeah. sit. Yeah. 
<laughs> go to sit at, sit at a uh, at a computer. And um, you know, I've also always been fond of using uh, virtual instruments of whatever stripe. So back when you know it was the '90s, I used to use various general MIDI uh, instruments, and they got better over time. Um, I remember having a Yamaha uh, soft synth that was just like blew my mind. It was just so much better than everything else. Sounds terrible today. <laughs> uh, but, you know, at the time it was it was really amazing. And then um, uh, eventually I, I got into uh, Vienna Symphonic Library stuff, you know, invested a lot of money in their stuff. Um, and then finally sort of moved over to to do you know, one of the things I learned about Vienna something like libraries you could use it in in your notation program so it you know oh, yeah. it works, worked in Sibelius um I use note performer now for that sort of thing that's that's another great uh library but I always like to have that audio feedback I'm not one of these people who can just have a piece in their head and you know it fully notates yeah. yeah I've got to I've got to just sort of sit down and play around with it and hit play and Go no, I need to change that note and then hit play again. And you know, it's a lot of going backwards and forwards. Um, I actually share this is so this is my uh, my study at home, um, but I actually shared this room with my partner who's a stockbroker. <laughs> All right. Or, uh, <laughs> during <laughs> lockdown, which you can imagine was uh, challenging. Uh, <laughs> me trying to mix over here, um, <laughs> you know, open back headphones and her trying to broke stocks on on the phones back. <laughs> no, not ideal. Um, yeah, but yeah, you know, I, so for me, it's always, it, it's my style of writing tends to be quite intuitive. Um, I will noodle around until I find something that works uh, and then try to expand on that. Mm. So it's interesting that despite the, so it's interesting that despite the kind of, you know, piano proficiency, even if you say that you're not a professional, but I, I know that you are like pretty amazing at the piano, at least by composer standards. <laughs> and um, so, so it's interesting that it's still kind of very technologically driven and has always been in a way because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I don't know, like in my mind, since I'm more of a like a techno m much more of a technologically driven composer rather than I mean, I, um, I, I did have like a music education. I can read music and, and all that. But I'm definitely like I came to that much later and definitely started more noodling with knobs rather than uh, than with keyboards. Right. Uh, and uh, to me, like there is like a, a clear separation between composers that are, you know, classically trained and, you know, and write on a piece of paper and and composers that are more like me, whereas it sounds like you are exactly in the middle of the two worlds, which is probably a really great spot to be in. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm one thing and I'm trying to be another, uh, you know, but that's it's just a sort of a way to stretch myself in, in different ways. And, you know, yeah. it's certainly, I, you know, I still write, um, this, this was a fairly... This piece was quite a uh, an experimental piece for me because I don't usually write things that are so textural. Um, usually, I, I will have some, you know, quite strong melodic and harmonic elements in there that are, you know, that are, that are a bit more classical in terms of their, um, yeah. in in terms of the way I think about them anyway. They, they sound like film score, um, but I'm you know I like doing this kind of thing I do think it's it's really interesting to be able to just explore sound um for sound's sake if you know yeah that, that, that is a really a really interesting thing like uh, that's what part of why I love the electronic music movement because in in many ways they are not even confined by the physicality of an instrument this kind of pure sound exploration and mm. and things like this kind of blur the two lines, blur the lines between uh, the two worlds, I think. Yeah, I, you know, I, I would really love to be uh, somebody who's very proficient in synths and uh, I'm trying to, trying to, you know, bring myself up that sort of learning curve because I would like to have a bigger palette of sounds beyond just the, the standard or orchestra. Not that I think, you know, there's, uh, you know, the, the standard orchestra doesn't have a hell of a lot to offer, you know, I th and I think it's actually underutilized by a lot of composers, Absolutely. just just how much, you know, the number of pieces I've transcribed or, or you know, I've done a lot of notation work, um, which have almost nothing in the way of woodwind writing, uh, 
you know, as for me, I've, I've just been actually working on my new template and um, uh, just doing it on a spreadsheet to start off with, to, to just try to keep everything organized. And I just counted, I have over 200 woodwind tracks. <laughs> and I'm somebody who uses expression maps. I, you know, I'm not one articulation per yeah. track. It's, wow. you know, I, I just have a lot of woodwinds because that's, you know, I, I think they just add so much color and, uh, and strings as well. You can do so much more with strings than just big soaring, uh, you know, three octave violin lines um, or, you know, soulful cello. You've, you've got so many other options. And that's what, one of the things I really like about libraries like uh, Poiesis is that, you know, you get, you're taking these traditional instruments and just creating non-traditional sounds with them which you know is is uh something we need more of i think yeah uh, i mean yeah that, that was definitely my uh, my idea when uh, when making it so i i'm really glad that you say that uh, and i've always been in love with the idea of using orchestral instruments to to create textures and in general to use something that is so you know rooted in in, in our musical tradition um for purposes where electronic instruments are normally used that is like a very interesting area uh, to me that i that i like to explore more of and yeah. and and i think also think that the that the music business has changed so much that we as developers of virtual instrument contribute very much to the music that has been released because making music doesn't mean or doesn't necessarily mean anymore going in in a big recording studio and spend loads of money with very you know expensive equipment we still manage to spend quite a bit of money on equipment <laughs> but it becomes more of a of a choice rather than a necessity like you can you can make music with with very very little today, the barrier to entry is very is very little and is very low. And the these sort of instruments, you're kind of give providing composer with the to, composers with the tool, uh, with the tools to 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 create new music. And so, like I like to think that we as developer uh, have have like a deep influence on the kind of new music that is being released. And so, I think absolutely we do. I, I, you know, it's. It's probably underappreciated, actually, just how, you know, I mean, you're, you're providing the instruments. It's, you know, you're like instrument makers of old. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I didn't mean to, you know. Uh, no, but, it, <laughs> but I, I just, I just, just something that I think a lot about when, when yeah, making the instruments, basically. Make, yeah. You're going to have an influence on the music people produce, right? Like, yeah. it's, uh, you know, if you, if you decide you're not going to uh, record, <laughs> um, a particular articulation or whatever, then you, you may find that doesn't, you know, that's that's not going to end up uh, in, in compositions. Uh, or if you, you know, you put limitations, you know, you, you hear a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, spiccato writing. Yeah, that is incredible how it's been influenced by uh, by sample oh, library developers. Right. You know, Absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's feeding into traditional orchestral writing because, you know, spiccato is easy to record. Yeah. <laughs> it's much easier than legato. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's become really uh, almost a bit of a cliche that it has, it, has a, it has to have a spiccato, you know, string section going on in the background. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, I, you know, it is interesting how these things are, are influenced by, uh, by the decisions you make. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, uh, you know, speaking of which, one of the things that really influenced this track was your decision to include pitch bends. Um, yeah, I wanted to I wanted to get into that. I was keeping yeah. that last because to me um, the that was like a feature that was uh, put in at the very last stage of development, actually uh suggested by uh by someone who said i really love having, having pitch bands in sample libraries and i don't know why they're not included more and so mm -hmm. like my idea was how about we put it only on one layer so that on one end you can use it to create you know like realism by changing the pitch a little bit but on the other end you can kind of crossfade between a pitch band note and a non pitch band note, and I really love the way you used it. Can you show us a little bit of that? 
I think so. Um, let's see if I can find where I've used it. So, I mean, in, the, in a very traditional way, I've used pitch bends a lot on these harmonics. So, um, let's try to make this a little bit bigger. So these are just harmonic notes where I've applied a pitch bend to the end of them. Uh, just hang on. So. I mean, obviously there's a lot of processing going on there as well. That's going through yeah. uh, a bunch of different uh, reverbs and just to make it sound extra ethereal. And I mean, this is kind of, you know, this kind of thing, chords obviously are not something you can actually do on a, on a cello. So I tried to use it yeah. a bit more like a, like a synth almost. Yeah. It's quite sort of Vangelis kind of uh, Blade Runner-y type stuff. Um, but there are other places, I think in which of these tracks, this one maybe. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That looks sexy. Let's have a listen to that. <laughs> What's remarkable to me is that sounds really good all the way through its range. Like quite often with pitch bends um, on virtual instruments, they start to sound very fake. But uh, I think certainly, I mean, I've used these maybe no more than a, a whole tone of pitch bending. Um, this one's a little bit more, I'm not sure what 4,800 is. Minus 5,000 uh, is in terms of uh, actual tones but yeah, yeah they they do sound really good all of these i, I think yeah well I, I think that the there are a couple of uh, factors that contribute to that first of all is that despite the huge amount of processing that you put on it so it's a bit hard to tell from from your track um it, it, it's, it's a very dry sounding library and 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 that that was one of the reasons why uh, we we made it that way so on one end we wanted to have like a very up close sound. One of the things that have been said while we were discussing how to record this is that we wanted to create a super intimate sound so that you had the feeling to be right in front of the cello or like almost as if you had your ear on, mm -hmm. on, the, on the body of the cello. But the extra benefit that uh, comes with that is that with an instrument so dry, you can really process it in whatever uh, way you want so that means mm -hmm. that when you're pitching uh when you're doing the pitch bend you're not also pitching down or up the sound of the room which is what makes it sound very mm. weird i mean and uh, and the other thing is that it has been recorded to 96 kilohertz 24 bits so it was entirely recorded in very high sample rate so that we could have a lot of room for processing and then we down sampled it to 4824 uh that's mostly because of cpu concerns uh and the resampling engine in contact can get a bit fiddly so the the end result is still at 4824 but was all recorded at 96 so that that uh, helped with the processing as, as well yeah. yeah well and you know i i ended up really incorporating that sort of pitch bend into even these chords um as an example here and here later on those are quite dry actually i don't know that i've got any do I have any reverb on those? I don't think I do. A bit of compressor and a little bit of um, this uh, uh, panning tool from Waves, which is pretty cool. Yeah, um, that's another interesting thing that you did. I really love the way you mixed very dry sound with, sounds with very wet sounds. Uh, that yeah. That's something that I do all the time. Like, is I think it's 
And again, you know, like if you're writing a purely orchestral piece, we are very concerned about everything sounding in the, you know, in the same room and you try to set yes. up your reverb so that you get like the sense of being on a scoring stage because yeah. that's the sound that you're going for. But in situations like this, you can get way more creative and and with sound, with, with like sound itself. And that's something that I do a lot of as well. Uh, you kind of mix together very wet sounds with very dry sound and you get you get like a bit of a third dimension in a way, which I think is very interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I remember watching uh, <coughs> uh, when it came out, uh, Milan Rouge. And yeah. I think the score is Craig Armstrong. Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah. And I remember there's, there's a tiny little moment in it, but it, it really stuck with me from that soundtrack where there's a violin line that starts off in reverb and sounding like it's part of the orchestra and then the reverb comes off it and it sounds super dry but just ah, interesting. And I just remember hearing that effect and thinking that's so cool like it just it, it suddenly makes it pop in this kind of unrealistic way um you know so, so it stops sounding like it is just uh, you know your standard orchestra instrument suddenly it's right in your face yeah, yeah and that's that's something you couldn't do in a concert hall of course but it's it's something you can absolutely do in in uh you know daw nice so yeah I've, I've tried to do that kind of thing a little bit in this piece just contrasting different layers you know some of the you know those harmonics for instance have got a ton of reverb on them uh other layers have got a little bit of reverb on them and then i've got these fairly dry ones uh for the the textural uh, chords as well Nice. Uh, shall we uh, just, you know, to conclude, I really love these massive major chords that you put uh, at the at the very end of it. Um, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about the harmonic structure without getting too technical? But uh, the a couple of things that I really like is that, you know, the piece has some pretty. Um, how do you say that in English? Close voicing, is that right? Sorry, I'm just mm -hmm. having a, a moment. Okay, yeah. close close voicings, uh, and then you get the last one that is like really uh, that is really spread out. And um, you know, I, I really like your your voicings, even when using just you know like a cello ensemble, if it feels much bigger. Can you tell us a little bit about yes, that? So I um I come very much from uh you know I've been orchestrating for very very many years, mm -hmm. um, and so I've got a fairly good uh, idea of what works uh, in terms of voicing um, and, and where you can, you know, in this piece, the voicing is actually quite thick uh, relative to what might be, you know, ideal from an orchestration perspective. Mm -hmm. But I've done that very deliberately. Um, but in order to give it a bit of heft and a bit of power and to make it sound like it's a little bit less just bunched up, um, I've uh, I've, th that's actually the reason why I've got those low notes here. So yeah. I'm actually, if you put these two together, you've actually got at least um, a fifth. So you've got all of these chords are built up pretty much from, uh, you've, got, you've got your root, you've got your fifth, root again, and then a third. And that's a really common like trombone voicing, really good for cellos as well. Yeah. Um, uh, your low woodwinds, you can do similar sorts of things just to give you that really sort of satisfying thick sound. Yeah. And as you say, it gets a little bit less thick right at the end, but the voicing actually remains the same. <laughs> what I've done right at the end is I've got these three. Only four voices. Just a D major. D major, and then right at the end, it's subtly different. And the reason is, as you say, I've changed who's playing what. So yeah. this um, this particular patch here, which is who am I using? Textural Reboot sounded to me just a little bit more satisfying in the middle, in this case. Particularly with my, it's, got, it's still got the sub bass um, in there, so you're still getting that thickness at the bottom. Um, 
and on this side I've got uh, also uh, no who have I got I can't even remember sorry textural dense yeah is that right no textural sparse no textural dense <laughs> um, but they've all got a different sort of character yeah you know, all of these textural patches have got a different character, so you can mix and match a little bit and and play around with, uh, with what sounds best. Really, um, in this case, I think it sounded best on that last note, just to just swap two of the voices around uh, to give it a slightly less um, heavy sound. Heavy sound. Yeah, actually, textural sparse is is probably my favorite patch uh, is probably my favorite articulation of all uh, which I, I've been wondering if sparse is the right name for it because it actually it, it is actually the one that has the most movement uh, the reason why we call this sparse is that because it has less pitch uh, and and it's wispy right like yeah exactly yeah. and so it was there are so many times where because of the bow bouncing so lightly on top of uh, on top of the string you actually get a lot of the harmonic without but the player didn't really want to do the harmonic you know what i mean it's kind of a natural yeah. phenomenon that happened so it has it, it is definitely the most uh, uncontrollable but also the most interesting to me it's, it's one, most surprising it's, and yeah yeah um, it's the one one of is definitely the one that i that i use the most from the library i think it's very interesting uh, i've also layered this on top of string sections libraries uh, uh especially the the one that are recorded more dry and it works very well in long sustain chords if you layer a little bit of this on top of other string of another string section it kind of gives like that tiny bit of movement which yeah. i think works really well it gives it, it, it yeah and uh, you know that's something that i think a lot of the early sample libraries uh just didn't have that sense of movement in them um, I find a lot of those very old VSL libraries, for instance, are very clean. And as a result, nowadays, they don't sound very real because nobody plays like that. So, you know, adding little things like this to, you know, particularly in, in a layer um, can really enhance yeah. the sound of, you know, the idea that you actually listen to a real live player because people are not perfect. Yeah, I feel that is very much uh, an innovation brought in by by Spitfire, where they yeah. said actually, you know, sampling is not a scientific environment where you you know record every single note under a microscope. Actually, sampling should be about our music, uh, about capturing the nuances of how music should be played, and that's another example of how developers and a pretty big one <laughs> that um, you know changed the way music is is approached and they were absolutely great at uh, you know uh, shifting the entire market and to an extent the entire music industry at least the media music industry uh, to um, you know in, in, to, to that kind of style which which I think it's it's a really good way yeah, and we're seeing similar, you know, work from, I, I think, uh, Jasper Performance Sample yeah, does an amazing absolutely. job of just capturing that, um, that human it. human element. Um, and, you know, I, I recorded, uh, I helped to record a sample library uh, for a, a, a colleague of mine who was, uh, who needed it for a, uh, a TV series. Yeah. Um, and we did, you know, very similar sorts of things of just trying to have textural elements that, were sort of layered into the the long sustains just so that you have that sense of yeah there's there's some real movement here i i think this was done because he, he had to record the the orchestra before the tv series had been made is, oh right <laughs> as, as you do um, yeah absolutely. So, you know, he wanted to give himself as many many options as possible <laughs> um and you know and it, it worked out very well uh but you know, I, I'm really looking forward to combining that library with this one, I have to say, because, you know, it's just it, there's a lot of uh, similarities, I think, in your approach and the approach that uh, the other, you know, other people uh, have been working with more and more these days. And, you know, I just I think it just adds so much more grit and, you know, um, and presence 
to 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 the music you know the last thing you want music to sound like is sterile yeah well i think i think that both approaches are absolutely necessary i mean you know like uh, vsl it's it's an amazing collection and they've they've been at that uh, for absolutely mm -hmm. ages and and you know and and there is also space for for something else i i, I hope <laughs> well, exactly and this this is why i have 200 tracks full of woodland yeah <laughs> exactly you, know, you you can't just have one you know you've got to have a bit oh, of everything absolutely. so absolutely uh, yeah. so thank you so much for this just to um you know to conclude again really loved your track um you know like it if it if it wasn't a um uh, you know like a demo track for my own library i would listen to it for the and they still do uh, for the pure pleasure of it because i think it's really a really interesting piece of music i really um, and it's also like very much my cup of tea so Thank you for writing it. Well, I'm glad you liked it. And um, to conclude, I'd love to know a bit more about how you get to work with those amazing names. Uh, <laughs> where the, if, if that's something that you can share. Yeah. But, um, is that like part of your transition from, from the concert music world um, into media music? I mean, obviously, Michael Nyman is not, I mean, it, he has done films but uh, but he's also like a very accomplished uh concert music composer and yep. like how did you get to make that transition well um so michael i met through uh facebook weirdly um oh, really interesting yeah, a huge number of my connections ultimately come through facebook which you know i can totally recommend as a, as a way of of meeting people at, for, from a professional network perspective particularly in music i mean my my stockbroker partner uses linkedin for making those connections but that's not where you're going to find musicians so yeah. um you know he uh i i was uh, uh i've got a little um side project uh which is uh, about uh, music engraving and he was looking for a new music engraver and he'd seen some of my ads and he knew my name from my having you know commented on some of his uh his posts before and one day just out of the blue he got in touch and said talk to me about music engraving and you know, we, we got on the phone and you know I, I did a bunch of music engraving for him and a bit of orchestration as well nice um, so that was you know and that's really good to sort of get to to know his music from the inside out um he's got a very particular style uh very tonal but you know it's he uses tonal stuff in unexpected ways um and often builds in sort of advanced harmonies as well which is you know yeah. it's a lot of i think I, I don't want to be wrong uh, i might be wrong with this but i think that he's also credited with having invented the name minimalism minimalism yeah is that, is that right he did i think he was a critic at the time he was yeah uh, writing music criticism and he came up with it. i think it's a derogatory term <laughs> <laughs> yeah actually and, uh, i actually <laughs> have his book where the you? name was first used somewhere okay. over there so that was interesting yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i think he actually reposted i think it was an article that he used you know some review that he'd written um the, the very first time he used it, and he re reposted it a couple of years ago nice um, but I mean, the other big, the, the person who's probably been the biggest uh, connection of mine in the music, uh, in the media music space has been David Arnold. Um, yeah. And I met him, I, it was, again, it was a very sort of serendipitous thing. I, I had a friend who was uh, putting together a concert uh, for a live performance of Independence Day. Um, oh. And he asked me so i i actually i approached this friend because he was very much in the media music world and said look uh, i'm interested in in getting in uh is anybody you can introduce me to or any you know jobs that you hear going on and he said yeah i'll, I'll have a look for you and he said look i've got a tiny job for you it's really small it's a couple of days but you know it's something and it, it's working for david arnold ultimately so I said, okay, what is it? And he said, well, you've got to go through, he gave me these two huge tomes. They were like this thick, um, this big. <laughs> uh, they weighed an absolute ton. And they were the original manuscripts from the recording sessions for Independence Day, or at least very high quality scans of them that they'd made immediately after the sessions as a kind of a memento. No, David's personal copy of the score. 
Wow. Um, oops. Sorry, that's my phone. I have a, a Veyburn as a ringtone. That's how pretentious I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought, okay, so all, all I had to do was to take this, this score and make notes on a poster on, you know, on set of poster notes of any changes between the final film and what was in the original, original score. So I sat down with this and after the first day, I had used about 15 post-it notes to get through about two cues. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I wrote to this, this friend of mine and said, look, this, there have been a lot of changes made to this. Because mm. that, that's what happens. But I mean, you know, it it's happens more or less depending on the film. But in this case, the editing, uh, the music editing had been huge. They'd done a lot of work on it. Um, there were, you know, cues that had inserts from of a couple of bars long that came from uh, the the second volume, you know, of of the score. Um, completely chopped and changed stuff. There'd been oh, wow. bars, bars that were completely missing. Orchestration had changed on the podium and hadn't been put into the score. Um, there was it was just enormous amount of work to be done. And I said, look, you're going to have to have this music engraved. Why don't you let me do it? And right. I would send him a sample. And the next thing I knew, I was engraving the entirety of Independence Day. Wow. Uh, for, for live concert and integrating all of those changes and, and making it, making sure that all of the hit points lined up uh, with, with, the, uh, with the film. So, right. yeah, wow. um, so I, I did, a, you know, that huge amount of work. And then I, 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 David hired me to come and do the same thing for Casino Royale when they did that live. Um, and I've ended oh, up cool. working with him on, on numerous projects since. So was this engraving for the, um, I mean, it was obviously for the live performance, but was it also for the scores that ended up being available? I don't even know if they are available for the public or was it like specifically for the... For the... They're, they're not technically available for the public. I think Independence Day got leaked. I'm right. Not sure, he did it because the version that that got leaked is not the final version. Um, ah, interesting. It, okay. it ended up on some websites. We probably can't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Chris Siddle is making a, a legit version of it, so he's got the actual rights to to the score, and he's producing a, a version of it that will be available for actual money. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would I would suggest people get hold of. Um, but, yeah, yeah if, it's, if, you're, uh, if you're getting a score of the internet and the score is has been written in the last 100 years or something, it's, you know, it's ask yourself a question, legit. basically. Yeah. Um, and but you know, I mean, that is it's an interesting point because there are so few film scores that are, that are available. Uh, thankfully, you know, um, Tim Rodeo at Omni has been doing a great job of uh, putting more of those out now, Chris. Yeah, and I think there is a massive demand for it. There so is, that, you know, and but the you know the the uh, the film companies own the rights to this music generally. Of they, course, they, they often sell them on to like Hal Leonard, um, but they're not they're not interested in being a publisher of you know sheet music. So that's it. Just doesn't really occur to them to go to the effort to, to put these things out there. And uh, it's probably also very hard because of what you were saying, like music in media in in films but in general in all media tend to evolve over time and change exactly, on, yeah. on, on yeah. during the recording session and so that's you know it's yeah, you you'll often find the uh, you'll often find that the OST is very different to the the version of the score that's on the actual soundtrack on on the on the film <clears throat> um, for for exactly that reason which is you know they they record a cue and then they change the cue when when it gets put into the into the film but for me just having access to those scores by you know somebody as very very talented as david uh was was a brilliant way to sort of learn the art of film scoring yeah. um, you know i again i have a big background writing orchestral music but there is a particular style of orchestration that is the film style yeah and i learned so much from uh you know nick dodd is, is david's uh, orchestrator from you know reading his handwritten scores um and just you know understanding it the way he uh he and david have put together this uh the, the sound that is you know 
Stargate and Independence Day and Bond movies. You know, it's movies, uh, yeah. it's, a, it's an amazing experience. Very very handy. And and also like film scoring is an interesting one in terms of orchestration because it takes from the symphonic tradition, but is very much studio music. So yes. that that gets reflected a lot in the orchestration. Like yeah, the, you exactly. you tend to write things that you would never dream of writing for a for a performance because you know that you're gonna have a lot of chances within the recording session to do things like overdubs and yes, you know, exactly. record sections separately and all that so that's something that i always found very interesting yeah i you know i i have to say i'm still somebody who really prefers to write stuff that's playable by an orchestra if it yeah. was in a concert setting part of the reason for that is because these days it's becoming more and more a thing right you know yeah. these live concerts uh you know, to, to the extent we have live concerts at all these days but um yeah <laughs> they're, they're, they're you know they're they're uh, people like them they they have quite a lot of demand and having orchestral music that can translate to that setting i think is is maybe an underrated uh virtue um no it's not appropriate for all styles of course but you know for for that sort of big orchestral stuff i think there's a lot more that can be done with an orchestra with a you know a standard symphonic orchestra yeah then then is appreciated uh, by a lot of composers who do rely heavily on DAW-based uh, writing where they can get away with all these, these overdubs that wouldn't be possible uh, in, in a real setting. Um, so, you know, but that's why I always tell people who are interested in learning orchestration, don't start from, uh, you know, as, as much as I think he's, he's a genius, you know, Hans Zimmer is somebody who writes for the orchestra in a very particular way that is not from the symphonic tradition. Yeah. Uh, and when you want to perform his stuff live, it takes a lot of rewriting of, you know, uh, of parts um, to make it work. But, you know, go back to, uh, to, to Mahler and Strauss and Ravel and Stravinsky and, and look through their orchestrations. They can do, you know, the, the, the sheer cinematic nature of some of that music is, is enormous and, you know, it can be all performed live by any symphony orchestra around the world absolutely yeah all right thank you so much for this uh, just to conclude i want to conclude with two things um first of all i'd like you to pitch your uh your latest business uh if if, if you want because <laughs> you have you have uh, a um uh, pc building uh, business basically which is specifically targeted to media composers. In fact, you're gonna hopefully build APC for me very soon. So do you want to uh, tell a little bit uh, about the, about that, give the web address and, and all that? Sure, so yeah, I started uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, a little side project called Opus 101 Pro Audio, website opus101proaudio.com. Uh, and it's just, uh, it came from my experience last year of building my own PC. Um, you know, I've, I've always been sort of pretty tech savvy, but uh, I had never built my own PC from scratch before. And I decided I was going to learn as much as I possibly could about doing that. Uh, did a huge deep dive into what are the specific bits of hardware that you need, or, or you know, which CPUs and what type of RAM and all of that sort of thing that you need to make an audio PC in particular, something that would work really, really, really well with these kind of huge multi-track, um, you know, thousands of uh, instances of uh, sample libraries, uh, kind of uh, templates. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I built this PC, which I think is, you know, it's, it's brilliant. I have to say, I'm very, very happy with it. Um, uh, and I decided I was going to actually use that as a template to, to build them for other people. So, you know, I, that's what I've been doing sort of on the side uh, this year is, is building these PCs. Um, and they're, you know, I, what, what I think is good about them is that they are very much built by somebody who is a working composer who, uh, you know, I, I have a very good appreciation of all of the things that the, the stumbling blocks that we run into as composers. I know how frustrating it is when you, uh, you know, when you have to deal with um, 
uh, clicks and pops and things like that when you're trying just trying to get on and write music to a deadline yeah and we discussed this before that it's interesting that the custom pc build there seems to be a gap in the market which i think you covered very well of you know like you you get the big gaming pcs that that you know are very optimized for that word but as have either uh, a lot of things that are unnecessary for us as composers such as big powerful graphic cards uh and and don't have enough of what we need such as loads of ram for example yeah, which exactly. is the, the one thing that you can get uh enough of and the other thing is also that um you know i'm i'm mostly a mac user but i always had pcs my own my entire life uh, as well and um and you know mac macs are great because they come very optimized like there is not a lot of tweaking to do which has its own cons that we won't get into that but uh, uh, whereas pcs are more of an open world where that require a lot of optimization a lot of tweaking and and you know being able to buy a machine that is optimized for that word uh, ready to go uh, i think i think is a great thing yeah. so yeah all the components i use are very much uh, aimed at, at maximizing your ability to, to make music um, and they're all very compatible with each other They've all, you know, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're good quality components as well. So, you know, every, the idea of, of these PCs is that they should just be something you can plug in and forget about and, uh, and it just works. Yeah. yeah. Nice. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, very last thing. Um, uh, I think you are in the great position of, uh, you know, like being working with music for the entirety of your life i think uh but but did a transition into another bit uh, of the music business which is media music and i've done that quite successfully working with with these big names do you have an advice that you want to give to either very young composers or composers that come from another side of the music industry and they want to get into media music i so i think certainly for uh for young composers i think the key is to <laughs> firstly to try to develop a style that is your own i think that's really important and, and neglected is is uh you can spend a lot of time aping the composers who you really admire and you should absolutely try to learn what it is that makes their music great um but if you can find something distinctive that will stand out i think that's that's uh, that's a better way to go forward. Is is just to you know when uh, music supervisors or or um, uh, directors are listening to reel after reel after reel, if they all sound the same, they're not going to you know you you might be very proud of uh, of the work you've put in to make some great you know epic orchestral orchestral track, but if it sounds like all the other epic orchestral tracks, it's not yeah. going to stand out. So you know find sounds that are, are different or that stand out and. Uh, try to develop stuff that is personal to you as a composer. I think that's good advice for any composer, to be honest, yeah. uh, media or otherwise. Um, uh, and in terms of making the transition uh, from other styles, I think the, the biggest shock to me has just been how much you have to learn that's beyond just music. Yeah. <laughs> so... so you know, you can be really writing good. is a I, tiny percentage of what we do, really. <laughs> totally, it's mostly setting up templates. You know, um, but like seriously, you've got to. You know, you, there's a lot to learn about production, um, which you know was never something that I thought I was interested in, uh, but it's something I've had to get very interested in, and I am now interested in it. Um, and so, learning about mixing and how to make your virtual instruments sound real, because you know, realistically, for the for a while, you're going to be working with just virtual instruments. You're not going to have access to to big orchestras or live players all the time. And directors um, are used to to hear demos that sound pretty much like perfect. the product. So yeah, yeah, they they, yeah. they got used to it at least. They did, yeah. And you know, I mean, yeah, if you're John Williams, you can get away without providing yeah. a demo people are happy to send you straight to the recording studio but these days <laughs> you've got to be good at those so 
you know, really learning the tools of the trade, uh, I think is, is important. And that's something you can do. You know, there are some good uh, all purpose sample libraries out there like uh, BBC Symphony Orchestra um, for just, uh, you know, allowing you to sort of just work with it on, a, on an orchestral scale. Yeah. Um, and I think people should really absolutely try and do that as much as possible. And also try to write to picture. If you're, if you're interested in writing for film, start writing for film. There are short films out there. There are, you know, you can do rescores, um, but, you know, there is a trick to writing for picture, you know, to, to picture, to make things hit the right points and to have the right emotional impact. And you can't really learn that without giving it a go. Um, or, you know, and, and watching lots of films, playing lots of video games, watching a lot of TV, all of the things that, you know, are going to, you know, you're just paying attention to the stuff that... All the things that your mom told you not to do when you were a kid, exactly. do it now. <laughs> Play loads of video games. <laughs> no one's mom told me to become a composer, let's face it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's, that's it. I, you know, if you don't love, I think if you don't love media... If you don't love film and and TV and video games, you're not going to be a very good composer of those things. You've got to really love them because you're otherwise why are you why are you even bothering. So that's that's Everyone my advice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right, Tristan, thank you so much. It was really fantastic. I really enjoyed it, and hopefully see you soon. Yeah, thanks. This is uh, been fun. All right, thanks. All right. <laughs>